my name is Virginia Kaklamani, Professor of Medicine at UT Health San Antonio, MD Anderson Cancer Center and leader of the breast program. Today, I have uh, with me two esteemed colleagues, Dr. Ruth Regan, who is uh, Chair of uh, Medicine at the University of Rochester, and uh, Dr. William Gratishar, who is the Chief of Division of Medical Oncology at the uh, Northwestern University. We're going to be talking about the San Antonio Breast Cancer Symposium 2021 highlights and themes. Our first topic today is going to cover immunotherapy options. And uh, um, what I wanted to discuss, uh, Dr. Gratisher, I'll start with you, is uh, two of the, the keynote studies, both called Keynote, Keynote 522 and Keynote 355, and the updates from SABCS. What are your thoughts on those trials? Well, immunotherapy has found a foothold in treatment of breast cancer, and I think it continues to evolve. So the two trials you're referring to, one in the metastatic setting um, and the other in the neoadjuvant adjuvant setting, have changed how we approach patients with triple negative breast cancer. So it's interesting at, at the outset that certainly in the metastatic disease setting, we require knowing the pdl one status. And in the keynote study, they did require that you have a, a, a CPS score done. And uh, what the data from this update shows us is that if you look at it more granularly, that in patients clearly who had a CPS score greater than 10, there was a clear benefit from the addition of pembrolizumab, and they further broke it down into those patients with the score above 20, and in those patients with the score less than 10. And for those with above 20, there was even somewhat uh, numerically a greater benefit from the addition of pembrolizumab. So certainly anybody with a score above 10 would be a candidate to receive pembrolizumab and expect that there would be some potential for benefit, whereas those with the score less than 10 there's really no um, observed benefit from the addition of pembrolizumab. So I think that um, you know, we have a bit more of a granular insight into who the patients are that are going to benefit. We also know from the updated data that there doesn't appear to be any toxicities that we need to worry about that weren't previously reported. So it, again, I think it, it's reaffirming, if anything. And then in the neoadjuvant study, the, the trial that looked the Keno 522 that looked at the use of pre-op chemo alone or pre-op chemo with Pembro to be followed by Pembro or not in the adjuvant setting, we again see the same improvement in outcome for the patients who got Pembro. And importantly here, we don't need to know the pdl one status. Uh, it's not a, a critical element to making the decision, but rather that patients have triple negative breast cancer. So the event-free survival looked good. Uh, it appeared to be a, uh, an effect that was seen across subsets of patients. So I think what this really tells us is that if you have a patient who would have met the criteria for the keynote study in the pre-op setting, then this would be an appropriate patient to consider for the addition of pembrolizumab. So some of the questions that arise really have to do with pathologic complete response versus not, and whether we should continue pembrolizumab in the adjuvant setting, whether we should add capecitabine. What are your thoughts in the different situations? Let's say somebody has uh, achieved a PCR with uh, the pre-op uh, Keynote 522 regimen. Would you continue pembrolizumab or would you stop it? Well, I think it's a good question, not answered by the trial, of course. Uh, but I think one way of making that determination in the absence of good data, at least in my mind, is if the patient had, you know, significant toxicity or something from the addition of Pembro and got a PCR, I would probably be tempted not to continue Pembro in that setting. Um, keep in mind that, again, we don't know the answer to that question based on the design of this trial. We also know if you look at the toxicity data, even though I was using that as an example, how I might make a decision, most of the toxicity was seen upfront when you were giving concurrent chemotherapy and immunotherapy, as opposed to the post-op setting where the uh, frequency of significant toxicity was much less because the chemotherapy is not there anymore. But in patients who had a PCR, uh, you know, right now I'd probably continue the Pembro unless there were some circumstances not to. And if the patient had a PCR, you know, I don't know that I would add capecitabine in that setting, but certainly if they did not, um, I would be tempted to do so. But again, the keynote study did, in, did not allow patients 
to have pe a Pembro plus capecitabine as part of their treatment plan. So Dr. Regan, if you have a BRCA positive patient, they're on the 522 trial, they're triple negative, they, have, they do not have a PCR, uh, and they would have been eligible for the Olympia trial, would you continue the Pembro and add Olaparib, or would you just give Olaparib to that patient? Yeah, I think that's a great question. I probably would continue the pembrolizumab and add the olapro because we do have data from the metastatic saying that you, showing that you can give them safely together. Um, and likewise, I actually had a patient this week who um, had received pembrolizumab pre-op, didn't have a PAP CR, and it's not a BRCA mutation carrier, and I'm going to give her capecitabine um, and continue the pembrolizumab. So I think that as long as there's safety data, I think it's reasonable to do it. Thank yeah, you. and I would agree with that example. I think that we have some safety data from other settings where CAPE and PEMBRO can be given, of course. And, um, you know, I would try to maximize the potential benefit in somebody that didn't get a PCR. Thank you both.